So, ladies and gentlemen, our speaker tonight, Sir Al Ainsley Green. It's always scary when people clap before you've said anything. <laughs> Uh, but uh, thank you, John, Rosemary, uh, the, the team here, for the invitation to be here and the introduction. It's a delight to be here. Um, why? Well, I want to share with you some of my insights uh, with this prestigious first ever uh, Widget Memorial Lecture, What is Good for Swinton is Good for Business. And my strapline, Carpe Diem, Seize the Day. And I believe that mantra is more relevant now than it has been for a long time. And up the top here, uh, you see immediately uh, the uh, Community Foundation logo. And can I just say thank you to you guys. It's an amazing organization and we're here to celebrate it. Uh, what you do is quite phenomenal and I hope you'll go from strength to strength. I've also put up in the center there um, a couple of logos. Anybody know who, what that is? It's the, uh, the badges or the badges of the Great Western Railway Company. <laughs> and I've drilled down into the history of Swindon and preparing myself for tonight. And they were phenomenal, our Victorian social engineers uh, who created wealth but also looked after people. And reading the history of how the GWR was committed to the people of Swindon, building houses, schools, facilities for enlightenment, we have to recapture, in my view, that drive uh, of entrepreneur, um, business, working for the benefit uh, of ordinary people. So Carpe Diem sees the day. Now, who is this exotic species, Professor Sir Al Ainsley Green? <laughs> what planet have I come from? I was forced to confront that question when I was appointed the first ever Children's Commissioner 10 years ago. The most difficult recruitment process I'd ever experienced, I had to sit a two-hour written test set and marked by children. <laughs> <laughs> I then had two 45-minute interrogations by seriously hard-nosed 11 to 18-year-olds, including young people in wheelchairs. And they went straight for my throat. Who are you, Al? Where have you come from? Prove you care about kids. Tell us how you've helped kids. And what are you going to do for us if you become children's commissioner? I used that model to appoint every one of the 30 members of staff in my commission, listening to what children had to say and hearing what they had to say about us. And I can commend the model to you uh, because they can scythe behind the veneers of our suits, our accents, etc. They know almost intuitively whether an adult is on the same page. So, what is Al's journey? Where am I coming from personally? Well, my dad left school at 14 to work underground in the local pit in the Northumberland coal field. I was born in the mining community. Uh, this image here uh, of miners' terraces, that's where my mother was born, uh, getting on for 90 or more years ago. I was born in a tight, community-based mining village. But my dad saw the writing on the wall for the coal industry, and so with enormous courage, he moved my mum, my sister and me down to Surrey when I was nine, where I was immediately bullied because of my funny accent, I couldn't do joined-up handwriting, etc. How many of you guys, put your hands up, how many of you guys were bullied as children? I suspect your experiences will be similar to mine, seared forever on your consciousness. And here's my first action point. Please understand that bullying is the big one as far as young people are concerned today with the emergence of cyberbullying, uh, etc. But what do we do as adults? What role models do we offer our youngsters for bullying in our worlds, in our businesses, in our professions? So I was bullied. A few months later, my dad died unexpectedly, leaving my mum in a very difficult financial situation. She was entitled to all benefits, as I was. Free school meals, a very pejorative phrase today in some circles. Because my dad had died as a 10-year-old, my intention was to become a doctor, 
to stop other boys and girls, mummies and daddies dying. That was my childish, childlike vision. I managed to get to grammar school where staff said, Al, you can do it. They helped me to navigate to medical school and the rest is history. So where have you guys come from that make you the people you are today? You will have your own experiences, your own journeys through life, but what has made you the people you are today? And then secondly, might you be able to share those experiences with young people? I can tell you from my ricochets all over the country, there is a hunger for young people to have role models, for adults actually to tell them about their lives and what they hold dear and what values they've got. So what have I done? I happen to be patron of the National Childhood Bereavement Network and I spend a lot of time with grieving children. And remember that a child loses through death a parent every 20 minutes in this country today. So here's me with an organization called Winston's Wish, which you may know, in circle time. Here are 10 youngsters with truly harrowing stories about their grief. A girl whose mother killed herself in front of her. A girl whose brother had just died from cancer. Two young people whose parents had been killed in a car smash. They could sit in the circle and tell me their stories. But I could go in Hang on, guys, I got the T-shirt. I know exactly what you're going through. And that immediately breaks the ice. And they can have an interactive discussion. At the end of it, greatly humbled when they say to me, I'll thank you. An adult is prepared to tell them what they have done. And you give us hope in the middle of our tragedy. So what can you guys do? Are you aware of the importance of grief here in Swindon, listen to what children have to say. And could you, in your incarnations, wherever you work, could you somehow please see yourselves as role models uh, for youngsters to follow behind? So the rest of uh, my story, I won't go through this in detail. I've had the most extraordinary privilege. Uh, some would say, by God's will, I'm not sure I support that, but I've been a children's physician. By the way, when I became children's commissioner, I never said I was a pediatrician because I saw the look on their faces. They thought I was a pedophile. <laughs> so I'm a children's physician. I've held two important chairs of child health in Newcastle and at Great Ormond Street. I was the first national director for children and government, the first children's commissioner. I've been chair of our Salisbury Diocesan Board of Education with 200 Anglican schools in Dorset and Wiltshire and 40,000 children. I've been all over these counties, guys, into the villages, into schools, seeing what's going on. And I've just stood down from uh, this amazing job of being president of the British Medical Association. That's a Friday afternoon job, if ever there was one. <laughs> so that's my background. And the strapline is the interface between politics, policy, and practice. Why should we care about children? Well, the hard reality that should make politicians sit up and even lie awake at night is this. Children today will be the productive adults to support an ever-aging population. <coughs> 20 years ago, there were four working-age adults per pensioner. It's down to about 3.2 now. And amongst the range of projections, it could fall as low as two, although that's very uncertain. But I can tell you Swindon's got a problem, if you didn't know, because the population dynamic, the graph of your people, you have a large bulge of people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. And within 20 years, they are going to be the pensioners. And somehow we have to find the young people now who will be the productive adults in the future. So we need healthy, educated, creative and resilient children with the life skills to thrive. Healthy, educated, creative and resilient children with the life skills to thrive. And this, in my view, fasten your seatbelts, guys, this should drive policy. Where is it? Do we have a national policy for children? We did have, it was something called Every Child Matters, systematically demolished by the coalition government. A few months ago, I sat in Winnipeg in Manitoba, very close to Rosemary's background. 
meeting 10 cabinet ministers around a table. This was the cross-departmental cabinet committee for Healthy Child Manitoba. They determined that Manitoba should be the most successful and welcoming province in Canada for a child to grow up in. And here are 10 cabinet ministers talking about what each of their departments was doing for the benefit of children and young people. Have we got that? No. There is no government strategy for children, full stop, at the present time. There is a strategy for competing with Shanghai through SATs and league tables in the education sector. But there is no joined up, in my view, holistic view of what we should be doing for our children in this country. Let's celebrate our children and young people. Here's one of the most amazing experiences I had. There's me, buried in a sea of 60 youngsters, each of them are being given the Diana Princess of Wales Award for some extraordinary contribution, overcoming difficulties. Look, here we have kids in wheelchairs. There was a traveling uh, girl whose brother had been knifed uh, to death, and her mission was to go into schools and tell kids about the risks of carrying knives. Every one of those children had some extraordinary story, heart-rending, heartwarming story uh, to tell. Do we celebrate our amazing youngsters enough? Would anybody like to make a comment? Come on, guys, you're not going for, um, uh, to leave the room until you've said something, okay? <laughs> so would anybody like to say something in response to my heretical hand grenades I'm throwing out? Do you think we celebrate our children enough in this country? No. Why? Jane, why? why? Um, I think that we still we we see them too much still as possessions. Yes. And things to be shaped and modelled. And now we we're obsessed with ramming education in their heads, and we've forgotten that they are individuals that that actually need nurture and connection in order to flourish. We've exactly. just lost the plot on the whole thing, really. I haven't uh, paid Jane to say that, uh, but I do so agree with it, guys. Um, I'm working with colleagues um, uh, with um, a Save Childhood, that's a movement, and Bath next year, the city of Bath, is holding the first ever International Festival of Childhood to celebrate what kids can do. So where do they fit in Swindon? Yes, so you wanted to say something. Yes, I think you're being a touch too pessimistic. Yes. Uh, I've just stood down entirely freely after 20 years as a secondary school governor. Yes, and fantastic. The local secondary school. Yes. What was green down is now the yes. Park Academy. Brilliant. Yeah. It's a multi academy trust. Yep. It's managing his and Bard secondary yep. school as well. Excellent. Now. And the big thing for West Swindon is to have a secondary school as its core. Yes. It gives them quite right. gives a shit. Yes, quite right. It really gives the monkeys down. Yes about yes. what's going down, yes. and the children that come in. Yes. And the cross-section of children in West Wind is quite exactly. profound. Yes, excellent. And the big thing has been, for quite a number of years at this particular school, to see achievements across the board. Yep. To actually give their students a leg up. Yes. And so, for the school to actually have two consecutively good offsets, to actually deliver 68% passes, this is, you know, there are good things happening. Yes, there are. Yes. And things are being achieved, and youngsters go on to university who might never have been expected to because their parents don't yes. read a book. Yes. Okay. Look, you're absolutely right, and one needs to be nuanced, of course. And there are fantastic schools across the country I've been to, and wonderful young people like this. But, but, the hard reality is we are not doing particularly well overall for too many of our children. And I'll show you some evidence in just a moment on that, if I may. But you're quite right. And well done for what you've done in your school as a governor. You need to be cloned across the country. 54% of adults believe children behave like animals. 45% agree they are feral, 49% believe they're a danger to each other and to adults, and 43% agree something has to be done to protect us from children. 35% feel the streets are infested with children. <laughs> and half of the adults felt that, um, believe that half of all crime is committed by children. Where did these data come from? They come from here. This is the Barnardo's report of 2008, invest in our children. Now, these data created a furore as you can imagine, with people denying the reality of the existence. But is there more than a grain of truth in this? 
Well, we are one of the most child-unfriendly countries in the developed world. Evidence. Three little snapshots. I live in Salisbury, beautiful, historic, affluent city. There is one notice, dogs are welcome in the store. Not far away, there's a convenience store. On the notice, it says, as from now, all school children, unless they're accompanied by an adult, are only allowed in the store two at a time. They're not to carry their bags around the shop. They can either leave them by the till or leave them outside. This has to be a permanent arrangement. Thanks. I'm sorry? Well, exactly, but that's, that's, that, that's the school. OK, so why? Have you seen these sorts of notices? What do you do about it, guys? What do you do about it? I'm sorry? But what do you do about it in practice? Well done. I went into this shop and I said to the manager, why have you got this? Oh, it comes from one high. We have to put this notice up. Why? Well, kids thieve. Yes. Well, so do adults. Yeah. Oh, well, we call the police. It's that wretched school up the road that's causing all the problem. I went to talk to the head teacher who was unaware of this going on under his nose. So I would argue, being provocative, fasten your seatbelts, these sorts of attitudes have become part of the wallpaper. The kids are demonized. And if you want the most powerful example of this, it's here. I was in Paynton. Anybody know what this is on the wall of the station? I was in Paynton. Yes, well done. The youngster said to me, Al, what's this horrible noise we can hear? Take me. Here on the wall of the railway station, they said, can you hear it? No, I can't hear it. There is this little box. This is the Mosquito Ultrasonic Deterrent, which is designed to disperse kids from gathering. It's based on the principle that once you're over 25, you can't hear high-pitched, pulsatile noises. So there's no point in paying it to you guys. You're all over the hill. <laughs> but this is sound physiology that young ears can hear nasty, high-pitched, pulsatile noises. Four and a half thousand to five thousand of these have been installed across the country. No regulation. Now, as Children's Commissioner, we mounted a campaign called Buzz Off. We wanted to have these regulated. I spoke to the Home Secretary. She said, Alan, sorry, we're always on the side of law and order, and we will not regulate these devices. But they're indiscriminate. Any young ear, a baby, a toddler, a child with autism will hear these just as much as kids causing trouble. They're not tackling the root cause of the problem. Why do kids gather? What did you do when you were 14? Did you join with your friends on the street corners? And then dispersing them, as I saw in one of the cities in the north of England, the only place kids could go was a dark bandstand. Nobody wanted them around their street corners. Now, you may think this is a figment of our imagination. Here, this very last weekend, through my letterbox came this freebie, Easy Life. And it says, keep pesky animals out of your garden. And here it says, added features include special control frequency to deter noisy teenagers <laughs> from your garden or house. Why? Why do we tolerate this? Why do we allow it? And what are your views about it? And how have we got these things in Swindon? Anybody know? Well, there's a bit of work to do immediately. Ask the kids. They'll tell you. So we have some problems with society's attitudes, and we now have some problems with society's policies for children. Now, three years ago, uh, our British Medical Association uh, published Growing Up in the UK, which is a forensic analysis of the state of children's health and children's lives uh, today. And the conclusions were, we really do have amazing children and young people. We have amazing staff in many, many places. But the hard facts, based on libraries of data, are that for far too many of our children, their outcomes for health, social care, education, youth justice, and poverty are some of the worst in the developed world. Now, this may come as a nasty surprise or an inconvenient surprise to you. Everything on that slide is justifiable in terms of hard data. And when we launched this three years ago, we had two public statements. Politicians have been failing children 
on a grand scale. And then secondly, national political focus on children has been short-term, inconsistent, ephemeral, and untrustworthy. And again, every one of those words can be justified. And it's not getting better. Look what's happened with the so-called obesity strategy, which has been demolished. A real missed opportunity, as Jamie Oliver and many others have said, the savaging of 35 pages of um, draft report under David Cameron down to 15 pages with anodyne recommendations under Mrs. May. So there are issues about our political focus for children. If that is the case, then yes, we have to chip away at the top level. But I would argue the inevitable conclusion is we have to build local communities with resilient children at their hearts. How do we do that? Come with me, please, to Luton, where I went on Friday. And here's me in Luton, a, a town with a very similar population size to Swindon. Here is Toco. This is a brand new building, five stories, right next to the civic center. Four kids, designed for kids. And here are the five floors. They have a roof terrace, which is let out to get income generation, a multi-use studio and a dance studio, art room, meeting rooms, counseling rooms. One of these counseling rooms designed at the request of the kids is make it look like granny's front room. Grandparents are really important. And so the kids wanted, when they were being counseled for their various problems, to be in an environment they felt comfortable in, like granny's sitting room. Reception, connections, games area, etc. And here's me standing outside at the entrance, and it is TOCO. The word means nothing. The kids chose it. TOCO, a youth space. Not a youth club, a youth space. Okay, so five stories, brand new building, created in Luton for the benefit of kids. And here is uh, uh, some more images. Here's the amazing chief executive, Fiona. And by the way, she invites you to go and see what she's doing uh, in Luton. Here's me having a lunch with some of the youngsters. And here are some of the sponsors for this, including uh, Luton Borough Council, uh, youth offending team, some uh, pr private companies, publishers, uh, Luton Airport, Tesco, um, Luton Town Football Club, Vauxhall, EasyJet, and Waits. Waits. These are some of the companies that have come together to fund this development for the benefit of kids in Luton. And here is Cameron, this guy here. He's now 19. And for the last four years, he's been working with architects and with other young people to design this facility, purpose-built for their needs. So there's one example of social enterprise in a city for the benefit of young people. Second case history, moving from young people to babies and children. Here's another inspirational lady, June O'Sullivan, who runs the London Early Years Foundation in Pimlico, with now 38 nurseries across other boroughs in London. It's inspiration. It's social enterprise. It's independent. It's designed to build communities with intergenerational involvement, bringing in grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles into the nursery to work with the kids. It provides apprenticeships for young people to get qualifications. It looks specifically at disadvantaged families and it's evidence-based. And please look it up on the website. Here are some of their um, uh, statements, their documents about social impact. I can tell you this process is intellectually robust. It's methodologically sound. It's research-focused, evidence-based, and impactful. So can this social enterprise model be used elsewhere? It can. No doubt about it, with babies, and Jane, I'm sure you may have something to say about this, the crucial importance of getting into nurseries. Third example, Thamesmead. I went down there 10 years ago when I was Children's Commissioner because I'd heard about it as a stunning example of businesses working with the community for the benefit of kids. In the 1980s, Thamesmead, which I believe was an overspill uh, area by Greenwich uh, for, uh, for, for London, they had a big problem with antisocial behavior. What they did was to listen to the young people and say, what do you want around here? And many of these uh, youngsters were difficult young men, naughty boys as they were called. And the young men said, we like tuning motorbikes. 
we like restoring bangers. And so with the local motor trade, they took on these redundant railway arches and they created this amazing facility, not just for boys, but also for girls. Tuning motorbikes, tuning cars, bicycles, etc. But also cookery areas, etc. So when I phoned them last week to check what progress has been made, they said they have about 450 kids on their books at the moment. And they say their success depends on two things. Attitude. The attitude of adults to these kids. And the second was the atmosphere that was created for them. And they've had amazing success in turnaround, which has been documented. They give a BTEC diploma, but using new teaching methods. Many of these youngsters can't read or write properly. So they're using audiovisual uh, techniques to, uh, to train them to BTEC level. Now the former naughty boys are instructors. Uh, in the setup, and the impact on ADHD and autism has been quite, uh, quite marked and has been subjected to rigorous external evaluation. And here is just one snapshot of some of the stuff they do. So what can young people in Swindon do, especially those who are most disadvantaged and nobody <coughs> wants to talk with or relate to? Fourth um, uh, example, uh, and this is my own personal uh, insight into entrepreneurial activity. I was professor of child health in Newcastle. And as our department and our strategic thinking, we wanted to do something for the lives of children in the north of England. How do we do it? Well, immediately we faced the reality we needed money. We couldn't expect the NHS or the university system to give us the money. We had to get off our butts and raise our own money. How do we do it? Well, I jumped on a plane to go to Queensland, and, uh, to Brisbane and Queensland, because I'd heard that the Children's Foundation of Queensland was simply amazing in terms of its resource generation for the benefit of children in Queensland. I came back through Cincinnati, where they have one of the best children's hospitals in the world, and they told me they owed their success to their long-term relationship to one company that had its world headquarters in Cincinnati, Procter & Gamble. I come back to Newcastle and I discover that at that time the European headquarters of P&G was in Gosforth, just outside Newcastle. So we eventually uh, got a meeting uh, with the, uh, the MD and his team. They expected us coming along saying, can we have 10,000 pounds, please? We didn't. We said, look, you guys are the world's best marketing company. We've got this idea. How would you market it? They were entranced. The consequence was they gave us for five years, free of charge, the full services of their new products marketing department. They said we will treat this idea in exactly the same way as a new brand of soap powder. And it starts with branding, it starts with identity, it starts with logos. So they, um, uh, they got Wickens, Toot and Southgate, a branding company from London, to come and spend three days with us. On the way back, they brainstormed what they'd seen. Courage was the word that came top. Courage of children in difficulty, courage of parents, courage of staff. What children's story do we know where courage is important? The Yellow Brick Road, where Dorothy is whisked away to a strange land. She meets the lion who wants courage, the tin man, the straw man. They meet the wizard eventually and she goes home. It's an amazing metaphor of a child's journey through difficulty. Out of copyright. So we promptly <laughs> copyrighted it <coughs> for our Yellow Brick Road, the Children's Foundation based in Newcastle upon Tyne. And this is just some of the marketing literature we had. Here's one of our, um, our brochures we gave to businesses. We realized there's no point in us as doctors or teachers talking to businesses. We had to have business people talking to businesses. And this is the business pack that was given to every company uh, in Newcastle. Uh, we invited the companies to appoint a yellow bricklayer uh, who would be the contact person between the company uh, and our organization. And we had a range of things like spreading the word, the vision, joint promotions, giving in kind. Look, this was given in kind in terms of paper by a local company. The graphics were given free. The ink was given free. That's an example of resource, not necessarily money, but expertise, skills, um, uh, etc. 
So we know this can be done. We launched this at the end of the 80s. And here is our traveling yellow brick road. Um, we got little kids to toddle along here. They got a badge and they raised money. And we used uh, sports guys here, Steve Cram. We worked with every school in Newcastle to help them raise the money they wanted uh, for their activity. And here's Yellow Brick Road Day with the kids dressed up and having some fun. One of our ambitions was to have a research center, a research institute. There's the architect's drawing, and here it is in reality four years later. This was generated by the sponsorship I've told you about, but also shaking the tins in the pubs and the clubs. And this has become part of the folklore of the Northeast. And this children's foundation is still going strong. We celebrated our 25th uh, anniversary just last year. It's changed its focus. It's had difficulties with its funding, as you could appreciate over the years. But it's still going strong as a focal point for showing what can be done for the benefit of children in the north of England. There's some other amazing opportunities I've seen. Here is uh, the connection service in Hove, where youngsters drop in. Here is Weymouth, uh, run by the Children's Society. And look at this one. This is Ryland's Farm. This is farm therapy for the most disturbed children. And these children are brought into this farm environment where they establish empathy with animals and with birds. Now, there's an example of out-of-the-box thinking. So what can we do with farms around here? Can they be involved in this kind of program for the benefit of children? And here is Quorum Life Education. Anybody here know about Quorum Life Education? You do. So what do you know about it? They go around to, well, in Wiltshire, they go around to primary schools. Yes, they do. And talk about drugs, alcohol. Yes, they do. Yeah. With a rather nice furry face. Yes, uh, that's the, it's a giraffe. Yes, that's right. Here's me in Bradford, and here's the traveling road show that goes around the schools. 800,000 children uh, through Quorum Life Education. It's here in Wiltshire, Thames Valley, and Gloucestershire as well, uh, supported by Rotary and other people uh, for this kind of activity. And here's rights respecting schools. Rights have a devastating public persona. Uh, we don't want rights. Well, here is an initiative from Canada where children learn every day of the working week three words, their responsibilities for each other, respect for each other, and their rights. And here's me in Andover, just down the road. Every school in Andover signed up to be kite marked for the Rights Respecting Schools program. The results are so impressive that the local authority is wanting to take this rights issue out into the community. And this is another thing we did in the Children's Commission. We were so appalled by public attitudes, we wanted to provide an opportunity for kids to show what they could do, and so we set up Takeover Day. And we launched it in 2008. Here's the flyer for 2009. It's now called the Children's Challenge. It's still going strong. And, and by within one year, we had 700 organizations and 17,000 children, young people going into companies going into hospitals, going into organizations, and taking over for the day. I had a 16-year-old who took over my job for me for the day. And I, she went with me um, and my meetings and so on. And the outcome is phenomenal. And the next takeover challenge is the 18th of this month. And I end with uh, how universities can help. Here's Northampton University, which is just amazing. It's one of only two. Uh, social enterprise, kite-marked universities in the country, the Ashoka U organization, kite marks them for being social enterprise. And Northampton University puts as its first strategic priority to make Northamptonshire to be a county in the UK for children and young people to thrive in. So I'm going to end, you with, uh, end with an image. This is who we're talking about. Here is a simply stunning, beautiful, newly born human citizen. And just look how she's manipulating her carer with this eyeball gaze, <laughs> which is a key trigger for attachment. This actually is the most beautiful baby in the world because she's my granddaughter. <laughs> but you will have your own feelings about your grandchildren. Uh, I would just say as, a, as an aside, Within a few hours of this photograph being taken, this little girl became critically ill. 
Uh, she required flashing lights transfer to local hospital, then to regional intensive care center, where as grandparents, importance of grandparents, guys, as grandparents, we saw the reality of our daughter and son-in-law struggling with the grief, the anguish, over this precious little baby being critically ill. She's now a lovely nine-year-old who's recovered from this. But can I please make the point, these are family issues and grandparents are critically important within it. But what does she need to achieve her full potential? Here's my final mantra for you. It takes a whole village to raise the child. Parents and families, critically important, but also communities, schools, faiths, voluntary organizations, professional staff, business, local government and national government. So how do we build the Swindon village? If you think Swindon needs to have a village in this kind of way. Well, you go to Canada, please come with me on a day trip to Vancouver and just see what the Canadians are doing in terms of mapping the lives of children in their communities. Mapping inputs, outputs, outcomes. And I saw in Edmonton recently a guy press a key on a keyboard, out came a printout of the nurturative assets for children by school locality. So against the school and its community, where were the creches? Where were the sports clubs? Where were the facilities for children? Using those data to target those areas that weren't doing very well for their kids. Is that a model for us to follow? Looping in with public health, all the enormous data tranches you've got, your report, which is so wonderful in giving hard information already about the lives of children. Why can't we come together and map this as an instrument for development? So wrap up. Here are some thoughts on social enterprise and impact. Please, can I encourage you to look out of your furrow and see what's being done elsewhere. And Rosemary and John and co, you got an invitation from Fiona and co from uh, the place I'm telling you about to go and see them. Thank you. And see what they're doing. And then the mapping, unless you understand your population through public health and so on, unless you understand that, how can you really make change? But it's not just that, it's also who's who? What's where? Where are the willing? Now, Rosemary, I'm sure you've got an address book that goes a long way towards this, but could it be done even more? Do you know all the voluntary organizations that support children in this locality? You may or you may not, but it's something to think about. And then, what's the vision? And then where's the strategy and the tactics? And above all, how do you break down the bunkers and the silos, which are everywhere through participation? By the way, we're talking about young people today. Where are they? Why aren't they here giving their views about what you guys could and should be doing uh, for uh, their benefit? And then businesses, amazing resources, marketing, media skills, resources, human resources, but also financial skills and in kind, as I've shared with you. Apprentices. We're desperately needing young people to have apprenticeships. Could there be an apprentice in the uh, Wiltshire Foundation? And then political advocacy to get these sorts of agendas on the road. So as I come to the end, two images here. You may or you may not wish to accept my view that it takes a village to raise a child. If you do, what do we need to do about it? Well, here we have your impact document, which is amazing. It's rich. You deserve a huge pat on the back for it. There's an immediate tension. You are doing so much across so many different areas. Would having something focused on children cause disadvantage? I can tell you when we set up our Children's Foundation in Newcastle, suddenly children being invisible, itsy bitsy, touchy feely, wishy washy stuff, there's us with our flashy lights, our road shows, raising resources uh, for children. A lot of people didn't like that. But then they're just as able to raise the money for what they want to do. So if you agree with this, what are you going to do? A provisional strap line for your marketing might be Swindon Kids Matter. So carpe diem. Are you up for it? If you are, could you build a series of huddles 
One of my privileges as BMA president was having unlimited access to BMA sandwiches. <laughs> and in our little dining room, uh, several times a week, I brought together people around a table to talk about things. And some very interesting initiatives have evolved. So a final comment, just to remind you what Nelson Mandela said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. So how are children treated, regarded, seen, valued in Swindon? And what does that say about the soul of Swindon? So thank you for your attention. <laughs>